And the word of the Lord read. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to read that one more time. And I say unto thee, talking to Peter, thou art Peter, Petros, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Those are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord. You saw one day we needed a place of worship. We needed that place that was consecrated and set aside that we might come in, worship, and honor you. So, Master, we thank you. Thank you for your words are powerful and your words are strong in this area of text that you've given to us to keep going back over and reading it and getting everything out of it that we can because of your goodness. Thank you, Master, for the church. Thank you for the institution and the organism of the church and the organization of the church. Thank you, Master. So use us for your glory. It's not I, it's the Christ. It's the anointing that breaks yokes. I can't do anything without you. In Jesus' name. I was going to talk about a purpose-driven church, but I want to really kind of stay right there with the gates of hell trying to prevail against the church. So I want to talk today about the church and how the church really is Christ's church. Maybe not so much a topic as to putting emphasis on understanding what the church is and who we are in terms of the church. In this area of text, the Bible says that Jesus was in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. The Bible says that he decided that he needed to take his disciples and get them alone and actually question the disciples and determine where they were in terms of understanding who he was. And so when you read this area of text, actually there, his conversation with the disciples go along with the statement that he made concerning his church. So he brings those disciples all alone by themselves to talk with them. Often he did that because he needed to kind of get a feel of just where those disciples were in terms of his teaching them and their fellowship with him and their walk with him. Can I preach just for a few minutes? So the Bible says that it was necessary. Here he's coming down to the end of his earthly journey, but he needed to really know exactly where his disciples were positioned. Because, you know, the Bible kind of lets us know about uh, the disciples. The disciples weren't always uh, obedient. They weren't always understanding. They weren't always where they should be in terms of understanding Christ's mission. And so there were times when Jesus himself had to rebuke his disciples, had to literally let them know. Remember Peter? You know, there are things you can't move too fast because time has to fulfill itself and my purpose has to fulfill itself. So what I must do is speak to you, rebuke you, and let you know that you have to hold your peace until the right time. So the Bible says he calls those disciples
disciples and he began to question them to determine what their thought process was and how they were thinking in terms of who he was. So he asked those disciples, first notice, whom do men say that I am? Because you're in the community, you're spread abroad, uh, you're doing the outreach, so who do men say that I am? I need to hear what you're saying about the thoughts of men and what they're saying. Well, the Bible says that, uh, he says, Peter said, well, the disciples said that some say that you're uh, John the Baptist. Uh, some say that you're Elias or Elijah. And some say that you are Jeremiah. Some say that you are just one of the other prophets. So why, 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 why do men have all of these different thoughts about who the Christ is? We're living in a world where we have all types of theological persuasions as to who the Christ is or who this man called the Christ is. When you look at this area of text, you will see that Jesus himself lifts up the church and makes it very clear of who the church was and who we are in terms of the church. So he says, well, they say you're John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist was a forerunner. John the Baptist was a forerunner. And they thought that the spirit of John the Baptist had come up in Christ. So he was coming with the spirit of John the Baptist. They thought that he was, they, that he was Elijah because they always taught that Elijah was going to come back right before Christ. They thought he was Jeremiah because they thought he was going to come back with the Ark of the Covenant and come back with the tabernacle before Christ returned. And then they thought he was another prophet and the spirit of those prophets had come up in Christ, if you will. Just a little bit of the history. And so they said that's what they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're noising abo abroad in the community as to who you are. And so as they began to respond, Peter quietly, you know, was thinking Then all of a sudden, Peter responds and he says to him, he says, listen very carefully, he says, thou art the Christ, one particular point of Christ's life, and then to the son of the living God. Notice his statement very clearly. I don't understand why the other disciples didn't get it, but the Bible says that Peter really got it. Even though he was, you know, kind of quick to respond when he should have, the Bible says that Peter answered in a way that Christ needed him to answer. Peter answered in the way that Christ, uh, under, that Christ knew he understood the time that he was walking with him. He really began to get the revelation as to who Christ really was. It didn't say that the other disciples didn't have maybe a portion, but he was the one that said that he was the Christ, the Christo, the anointed one, the Messiah that the prophets had already talked about. So Peter understood that all that he understood about the Old Testament and about what the prophets said had come to pass through the very Christ that he walked with. Isn't it amazing that disciples walk with you and don't even know who you are? They suck with you, they eat with you, they, 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 they praise God with you and don't even know who you really are. You know, they don't understand how you matriculate. Who do men say, and then as a matter of fact, disciples, who do you say I am? Who am I in your life? Who, what, you know, what, what essence do I have in your life? You know, what influence this time that we've shared together, you know, who am I? Who am I? Who do you understand that I am? Do you think I'm just a, you know, a miracle worker? Do you think that I'm just one that, you know, works these uh, uh, powerful moves? Who, who do you say? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, the God that, that, that's in you, the God that created you. Uh, the both of you are the same. You are the you are son of the living God. And the Bible says that Jesus responded back to Peter and said to him, Simon, notice how he puts emphasis on that first name. Simon Peter, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this thing to you. See, see, Peter still didn't fully understand, but 
he understood this much that that flesh and blood just can't 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 reveal it. It has to be a connection. There has to be a connection to the spirit of the Lord for you to get some things. Amen. You can't just come to church and not be connected to the Christ. You just can't come and 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 get in the in the in the the the, the whole uh, 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 fellowship of Christ and not be connected with the Christ. You can't just come to church and look cute and act ugly. You've got to come to church and get connected to the, who do men, who do men, and then who do you say that I am? Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, didn't reveal uh, this thing to you. It had to be the God, the God, my Father, the God of all heaven and earth to reveal this thing to you. It had to be the Spirit of the Lord that revealed this thing to you, that thou art the Christ, that I was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Bible says, he says unto him, thou art Peter. Now listen, after Peter had made that declaration, listen, if you want blessing from the Lord, you have to get connected to the Lord. Yes, he blesses, he reigns on the just as well as the unjust, but if you want blessing from the Lord, you've got to get connected to him. You must know that he is the Christ that he is the son of the living God. And so he told Peter, because you made such a powerful statement, he had 12 disciples, but Peter was the one that the Lord bestowed additional blessings. It wasn't that the other disciples weren't blessed, but additional blessings because he was connected to the Christ, the church, the mission, and the purpose. So he was connected in the sense that he understood that his life could not remain the same. His life could not stay like it was. His life had to, had to totally change because of this revelation. You've got to get a revelation about Christ. You've got to understand who he is in these last and evil days. And so the Bible says that he told Peter, thou art Peter, thou art Petros, and I'm going to build my church, Petra, on the rock, on this rock now. I don't want to differ with people. Now, there are a lot of persuasions that Peter was the one that the Lord built the church on. No, that is not true. Let me just say that. I know we have different, uh, different theological teachings. No, Peter wasn't the individual, but Peter was the first one to herald the message after Pentecost of the church. And see, the reason why I said it's so important for us to be connected to the church and be connected to the Christ Christ understood that Peter had the right message. If we're going to be a church, you've got to have the right message. And guess what? You really have to have the same message. You can't say one thing out of one corner of your mouth and then say something else out of the other corner of your mouth. You've got to have the same message that Christ himself preached. You can't have a double tongue. You can't have a glib tongue. But your tongue has to be that type of tongue that blesses that tongue that preaches and understands what it means to preach Christ and him dead, buried, and him crucified and arisen from the dead. And he said, so Peter, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you, Peter. I know you're quick. I know you can do it. But some of us have bad tempers, don't we? We're quick about everything. See, God can take that and turn that around and use that for his glory. If you let it. If you let it, if you let it. And so he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I come to tell you today that the gates of hell won't prosper. <laughs> the gates of hell won't prosper. It just won't work. Jesus says to those disciples, I am the Christ and I'm going to build my church on the message of my disciples. I'm going to build my church on the testimony of my disciples. If you don't have my testimony in your mouth, you're going to get in trouble. The gates of hell will not prevail. Prevail means to overcome. It means to overtake. It means to take charge. It will not. This is what Jesus said. So I am 
cautioning and charging the devil today that no weapon that is formed against us is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises against the ministry. God's going to deal with it. If you don't know what to say, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> the gates of hell shall not. He said, now listen, Peter, you've got to understand one thing. Now, I'm giving you authority. I'm going to change your life. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you keys. See, the Lord has blessed the church with keys. We don't even realize sometimes how blessed we are as a church. The Ecclesia. And what I mean by that is when you look in uh, some of the studies, the Ecclesia, Ecclesia was really when they would call people out to discuss specific things that needed to be discussed publicly. But then eventually what happened in New Testament, it was applied to the church. Because the church had the ability to change and transform no matter where they went. See, then they didn't have the beautiful edifice like we do. They didn't have all of the air conditioning like we do. So what they did, they moved from place to place. As a matter of fact, it was the will of God to scatter them so that they could go and just witness of the goodness of Jesus. So we're change agents. That's what we are supposed to be. We're supposed to make a difference in the world. And we're supposed to make a powerful difference for Christ. Not, you know, a bickering with each other. Not fighting with each other. But we're supposed to make a, a, a powerful testimony and be a witness for Christ. So the Bible says that these people in the early church went out and witnessed of the goodness of the Lord. They got in trouble, but it was okay because the Bible said they turned the world upside down. Even these unlearned men, so you can't speak eloquently, so you can't say the right words, so you can't pronounce it right. Still, God requires of us that we are to move forward and do them. We have a mission that we are to be about. So the Bible says that. He said, I'm going to give you keys. And he said, I'm going to give you the power to loose and to bind. Now, now listen, the loosing and the binding means uh, to open up and to close up. Also, it means to tear down and then build up. So every one of us, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, are living stones because the apostle made sure that we understood one thing if you profess to be a believer. That if you're supposed to be a believer in the body of Christ, we are lively stones and we are building, we are continuing to build, build the church. But it is Christ that establishes the church. It is Christ that brings form to the church. It is Christ that brings the power into the church. It is Christ that makes sure that his church operates the way that he wants his church to operate. Come on, 